All right, so I'm going to be talking today about how we can use randomness in testing to, um, well, in a couple of different cases. There are a few different places that randomness can come into testing. And the first one I'm going to talk about is using randomness to find edge cases. So um, my last talk, I think, I, gave this, I did this kata where I was talking about a board game. And I had this nice picture of the board. And that made it really easy to figure out what the edge cases were. I just physically look at where the edges of the board are and use those as my edge test cases. And the idea is that if you, if you do testing kind of like around here and around here and get, get all the corners and maybe some things on the outside of the board, then that once your program works at the edge cases, you pretty much know it's going to work for everything you want to do. But if you have something more complicated, like some kind of system with a lot of dimensions or something that's just the structure of it could be really complicated and hard to comprehend, it's hard to know what the good edge cases are. And if, so what are you going to do about that? Well, if you really don't have a good handle on the structure of your problem, sometimes the best thing you can do is use randomness to just randomly pick test cases until you find things that fit. This strategy is called buzz testing. So I'm going to show you a little example of that. I kind of did it as a product here. I'm not going to do the cut for you. I don't want to steal Nick's thunder. But um, so I have a specification here for, for a program that's supposed to, for a method that's supposed to capitalize each line on the screen. And so I thought of a couple of edge cases have just a single line in your string, then it should just capitalize that line. Here I'm specifying that if you have a string with three lines, so it says blah, 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 it should return capitalize blah, blah, blah. And I tried to make it a little bit more of an edge case by using a capital letter already on the third line to make sure that my program didn't crash or something. <coughs> That's what I, that, those are the edge cases I was able to think of. And here's the implementation. Here's what I came up with. Don't worry about the second method or the other tests that we're in there. I'll talk about that later. So here, capitalize each line. And what I came up with this. This is actually a terrible way to do it, but it's supposed to demonstrate a point. So I split it into, I split it on new lines, and then on each line, I, I apply upcase to the first character and join them all back together with new lines. And so it works. So on our spec. And all my tests pass, so it's probably good, right? Well, this the, the problem domain here is strings with characters. And that's a really high dimensional kind of thing. You can think of each character basically as a different dimension. So it is kind of like that picture, this picture here where it's so complicated that I really shouldn't expect to be able to find all the edge cases just by thinking about it. So what I'm going to do here is insert some buzz testing. I just prepared this ahead of time. So, so here's how you would do buzz testing in a typical, typical case. I'm going to try 20 random test cases. And for each test case, I'm going to generate a random string. It's a totally random string. This is how you do it in Ruby. Um, or that was the best way I could find Random 10 characters. And then, for my specification here, since it's just a random string, I don't know ahead of time what the answer should be. So the best <coughs> thing I can really do is just check some kind of consistency. So I'll just check that if I capitalize each line of the string and then downcase the whole thing, that should be equal to what I get if I downcase the original string. Basically, capitalize it, downcase it again, and nothing should change. So let's run that test. So I passed this time, but I was only checking 20 examples, so I should probably run it a few more times just to be sure. It will fail eventually. Let me drop it to 100. <coughs> all right, so I ran it 100 times. You can see all those dots for all the tests. It failed once. If we look at it, you can see this here is the string that it came up with. You know, see that again. Thank you. So there's the string that I came up with. It's kind of hard to read, but um, you can see there's a new line here, and there's a new line at the end. So this new line at the end, that's 
probably the edge case that I didn't think of in my example. If you run it, if I run it a few more times, I'll find a few more edge cases. Um, but I'm going to talk later about what to actually do next. But I want to move on and talk about another kind of another situation. Oh yeah, first I should note that the plus tests. So in this example, you saw that the tests had to be a little bit more simple-minded than your normal tests because you don't know the answer ahead of time. You're supplying it with random data. So the kind of stuff you could do is maybe just look for exceptions or look for if your program takes too much time or crashes or something like that. In my case, I did this second option of checking that the outputs are consistent with the inputs. But if you want to do something a little bit more intelligent, you could try to compose some, in this example I could make maybe, I could try strings that only have one letter each. And then I know that the output is just going to be the capitalized version of the, sorry, strings where each line just has one letter then I would know that the, the capitalized version is just the same as applying upcase to the whole string. So it would make it easier to test because I've, I've simplified my set of random strings. That, that's a hard thing to do in general, but it's worth considering. And also, buzz testing, it's not part of RSpec at all. You just use RAND in your tests, and that's, that's how you do your buzz testing. So, the other really common situation where randomness can be useful for testing is in discovering test order dependence. And the idea here is that um, you, you really want your tests to run independently. Every, um, so in our spec, every, every gig, what's the technique there? Every example should be, um, should, it should not really be doing anything that affects the other examples. It should only depend on the objects that were created in the context that it lives in. And it should not break if something is created in another context, like if some file that is made by something else that shouldn't cause your other tests to fail. This kind of problem can occur both because the tests are written poorly or because your code has some internal dependencies that you're not aware of. So now I'll show you an example of that. Go back to this specification. I'm going to take out the um, buzz testing for now. So the second part of my little kata here was to capitalize every line of the file. And don't worry about that thing at the beginning. Um, basically, we have two <coughs> contexts, and each one has a single example. So my first one, I just made a file that contains the line ABCD, and I'm saying it should capitalize that. We know that works already because I had another spec with that. I mean, we know that the single string version of it works. Um, the second test is that if there's no file, the way I'm doing it is removing the file I created in the, in the previous context. If there's no file, <coughs> then we expect capitalized file to raise an exception. Pretty simple idea here. And if you look at my implementation, there's not much to it. Capitalized file just does file.read and then throws it into this capitalize each line. So let's see if the tests pass. Yep, the tests are passing, so it looks like everything's pretty good. The problem here is that it only works because these are done in this particular order. If I take this context and move it up above this other context, try to run it again, suddenly it fails. I mean, if you look at how it fails, it says it failed because file.unlink failed. Look back at this, at the way I set this up. The way I'm creating a case where I have no file.txt is by specifically removing it here. The problem is that assumes that I had made that file in the first place, so it's, it's order dependent. Now it turns out that this kind of testing is built into our spec. So I'm putting it back to the original order. I'll show you that it does, it, it passes by default here. But if you want to look out for this kind of thing, you can just run RSpec with the order round option. And sometimes it'll pass. Come on, zeros. No failures. Come on. Come on. No failure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Should have been a 50% chance, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, you're lucky there for a while. Yeah, so, so sometimes it fails, sometimes it passes. And what our spec is doing here is it's just taking all of the examples and randomly shuffling them to, to other running tests. If you use JSON 
assumes true hydrogen and it automatically includes that as a default for you. A lot of people think it should be a default. I think you should probably use it. I don't think I'm using it yet. <laughs> but I will after this talk. So, so what now? So if you're doing random testing and you get a failure, you are in an interesting situation because you want to fix the problem, but if you try to run your tests again, even if you don't change anything, you might not get the failure again because it's, it's random. So um, I'm going to first show you that with our spec, if you're running, doing this order RAM, every time you run the spec, you, every time you run the specs, it says prints out at the bottom, randomize with C, but and what that means is that our spec has come up with a random C to initialize its random number generator. And every time it's different. So if you want to get the same results, so this time it didn't fail, see? So if I want to get the same results, I just add this dash dash C option. It was a 6336. It was a failure one. If I run it like that, it'll fail every time because it's using the same random C, doing the testing exactly the same order. So, so by initializing the C to the same value, you can then spend more time looking at exactly what went wrong. If you have to run a debugger, it'll probably be debugging something that actually has the problem that caused your specs to fail. Unfortunately, let's look at what happens if we do this with our fuzz test. So I'm going to put that. Um, Let's just get back in. So now I've linked together the, the randomness of the ordering and the randomness of my bus testing. There's a subtle potential, maybe theoretical problem here. If you just do it like this, I think it's a bad idea because now our spec is going to be generating the same sequence of random numbers that you're generating in your tests. And for example, you, if 
first one our spec generates will be the same as the first one you generate. That might cause a problem where the order of your tests affects what you're randomly generating in your fuzz testing. For example, every time test two runs first, it'll generate a string that starts with the letter A. And that can lead to some really subtle and weird bugs or I guess failures to fit, failures to detect things that you think you should be detecting. Like where you run it a hundred times and it never comes up as or something. So instead, I think you should do something like add one or maybe add a random number of 137. And that will guarantee that your sequence of random numbers is fundamentally different from the one that RSpec is doing. I don't know internally what RSpec exactly what it's doing, so it might already do something like this. But I think that's a good thing to protect yourself. So then, um, what you really want to do is, whenever your tests fail, you want to you want to keep running them with the same random seed until you fix the problem and get them to pass. So I figured you might as well put that together. In, you, might, you might as well do that automatically. So I come up with something that does it. So this little example, I'm storing the seed in a file called the RSpec seed. Started out at zero <coughs> by default. You can use that as the, as the seed for our spec, so you don't have to specify it on the command line. Turns out, doing this also sets into order equals RAM automatically. And then I use that as my own RAM seed. And I guess I'll have to change this one to a 157, because I think that's a better idea. And then what you have to do is, after all your tests run, using this after sweep up, Check whether the tests fail. I got this, um, this little bit of code from a really helpful guy on the Stack Overflow. Um, the David? Yeah. Oh boy. Is those, are those points legal? Yeah. Brother, brother, I don't know about that. Um, but basically, this just checks if any of your examples fail. And as long as they didn't fail, I write back to the RSpec seed with an updated seed value. So let's look at how this works. To make sure I don't have a, a RSpec C file to start with. So this one, <coughs> oh shoot. Um, oh wait, it was just a normal there. Okay. Yeah, um, so, it, so it says randomize with C0, and it failed already. Uh, Kind of worrying. Oh, sorry. So let's see. I'm just thinking. What I just pasted. It's like more of an error than I expected. Just looking at the clock. Maybe, Maybe that plus 37 is causing you problems? No? Yeah, I don't know. Got it. It doesn't like your breaking for some reason. Oh, it doesn't like your breaking. Alright, let's not. Line 9 is that one? What was it, examples that? Huh. Let's do it like that instead. That was the last one that changed. Alright. Okay, so it fails with seed zero, has two failures, and is, as I keep running this, it'll keep using seed zero. I have to fix those two failures to get it to proceed. So let's do that. So here we have one, here we have one good edge case. I'm just going to go over to my spec and stick that in. Because whenever you find a failure, whenever you find a good edge case, you want to make sure that you use that. You want to make sure you use that in your tests. So that's one edge case, and there's this other edge case, which looks like has a new one at the beginning. It's probably what makes it special. So here are a couple of good edge cases, and I'll just copy in exactly the same test that I used. Was testing. So I'm testing this thing on both of the edge cases. Uh, you never said it's oh, yeah. specified. All right, there. Ah, okay. um, so now I get four failures, of course, and it's still on C0. But let's look at what actually is going wrong here. Well, 
There are actually two problems. The, the main problem is that line zero is not always defined because sometimes the line is empty. Both of these cases are going to be generating potentially empty lines. There's an empty line after this new line, and there's an empty line before this new line. So really, I want to add if the line, if the line's not Now only the one with the new line at the end is failing. And this is actually interesting. I didn't expect this, but it turns out that split does not split on all the new lines. It ignores new lines at the end unless you can get the margin that it's negative. So maybe with a minus one, then all my tests pass off. See, that time it still ran on C0, but since the tests are passing now, it will increment the C every time. Until then, it's until something else goes. There. There's time again. Um, so now I've got this other failure where I have a problem with the, with the order of the tests. And in this case, I would try to debug it just by looking at my test and trying to understand what went wrong. And pretty soon I realized that this auto public is the problem. And well, the easiest thing to do to fix it right now is to just ignore exceptions. Now the test pass, again it ran it on C5 since it had failed the previous time. As I keep running it, it'll keep incrementing it, and I think now the code is good and nothing else is going to fail. So those are the two basic ways to use randomness in testing. I think those are probably the most common, but some other things that you should be aware of are one is code mutation. There's a gem for Ruby called Mutant that does this, but it doesn't work with 2.0 yet, so I didn't try it. It'll randomly change lines of code in your program and then run your tests to make sure that your tests break. That's really interesting because it tells you whether or not you're actually testing those lines. Another thing is, if you're ever doing anything with parallel processing with multiple machines talking to each other, you're guaranteed to have timing issues that can cause some kind of randomness. So, for example, in our tests for our website, we get shipping quotes from FedEx online. Sometimes the servers are down, sometimes they don't respond very quickly, sometimes something times up. And just, you can't get away from that kind of thing if you're going to do any kind of thing with multiple systems. And the third way that randomness comes into testing is if you're intentionally using randomness in your code and you want to test that, that's a completely different issue because you want to, <laughs> want to make sure that it's random. Um, all the stuff about the seeding is still important. So I'm not going to talk about that. So. Any questions? Comments? Have one question. Yeah. The RSpec C file that you created, would that be something you put under source control, or would you let that kind of be a developer? I don't know. Source control is someone else would need to close. Well, you're actually the error. Well, it wouldn't. I think you'd probably yeah, just communicate the error your process. I think you're going to get a bunch of annoying conflict. You're going to get a conflict every time you merge, so I would not. Yeah, yeah, I, I would not. We do it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I want to start each developer on a different seat. If you want someone else to make sure they run the same, yeah. just tell them the number and have them put it in there. Yeah. Okay. Right. Have you considered patching the RSpec to automatically do this? I think I've considered it. And submitting a pull request that can be way too uh, <laughs> controversial. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know, it's definitely, I only thought of this like, in the context of writing this talk, so I don't know how great of an idea it is. Cool. I should say one issue that David brought up with this is that he likes to run a subset of the tests while looking into a problem. So probably I would want to modify this to have the C be different for every subset of tests that you run or something like that. So that if you do that and it passes for some subset, it doesn't affect some failing C on a different subset. That can be impressively complex if you use nested contexts. Yeah. Right. Because the, the seed of your inner of your innermost context would. End oh, I wouldn't want to use different seeds for the different contexts. I would just right, but 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 the, the only the only way to break up the fragments is either by describe yeah. or by context within describe. Yeah, I think breaking it up would be kind of hopeless. 
but at least if he does, if the, whole, if the tests are failing overall, and then it goes into the by running a single test, and that happens to pass, you shouldn't put that in advance the seed. You, you, could just, you could just store the seeds in files based on the command line arguments you sent to RSpec. Yeah, or, or I have the list of all the examples here, so I could use like a hashtag. You know, to me, it seems like this is a good way to discover edge cases, yeah. but then you should document it within your yeah, so specs, right? And yeah, then exactly. and then not leave the random code in there once you're confident that you've covered your edge cases. That, to me, would make more sense, but I don't know. It just... Yeah. You might, depending on the specs, you might discover new edges that come up when you read back to your code. Right? I wonder if uh, spec discovery is a gem name that's available. Sorry. One thing I was wondering about is whenever, so I guess in our spec, we use factory girl, we generate lots of factory girl, and I'm wondering whether I should be filling out the various parameters in my models with the data, or whether I should be using these fixed predictable data. Anybody have a few ones? I actually have the same question. Faker. Easy. So I know that. Forgery or Faker? Faker, faster Faker. Well, but should you do it at all? Yeah. I'll, 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 unless you do a lot of either complex pattern matching validations on your on your model attributes, or you are allowing for uh, user input that you want to verify proper standardization of. And you some randomness to that. I think randomizing your your factory girl data, um, if you feel like you need to do it, chances are you've got too much cell. Well, so one thing that it might help you for that is um, it's really tempting when you have your factory girl data. When your factory girl data is making predictable models, it's really tempting to use the values of those models in your tests. And you really shouldn't do that because your tests should specify everything that they test. Right. So for example, the way I have it set up right now, product the products get numbered in order. It's product one, product two, product three. And so I might just test that the title of the page for product three says product three. That would be a mistake. It should really be testing that it matches the name of the product. Yes. That it's a different string. Right. But I don't think the solution is to randomize what factory girl creates. The solution is to not do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's <doesn't laughs> because because basically not hard code strings and numbers. I think, things I think factories should be set up with extremely basic data that's the minimum data needed to make a valid object. That's what a factory should produce for you. And then, to your point, if you need to test something, you should be explicitly overriding certain things to be what you are testing. Um, and so in, in that case, it doesn't really matter whether it's random data or whether it's some other thing. And I would, and I, I, I see Brian's point that if you're trying to test specific validations, then that are complex or something, but I, I think even then you're better off ignoring your factory there and just doing some fuzz testing like you were saying and you know not even necessarily even using your factory or using your factory but setting your field to whatever fuzz tested value it is for your validation that's complex that you want to make sure you get all the edge cases too. Uh, I wouldn't put it on the factory to, to be doing that um, yeah, the, 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 the minimal amount of data to create